Good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you to Middle Bell Baptist Church. If you could all stand for the call to worship. I will now read to you Psalms 4. Answer me when I call God who vindicates me. You freed me from affliction. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, exalted ones, will my honor be insulted? How long will you love what is worthless and pursue a lie? Know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin, reflecting your heart while on your bed and be silent. Offer sacrifices in righteousness and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us anything good? Let the light of your face shine on us, Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when they, with their grain and new wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, Lord, make me live in safety. I read to you Psalms 4. Thank you. As we open up in worship today, we ask that you take a seat for just a moment. Take a seat. We're going to do a couple of songs this morning, a couple of hymns. But before we do, one of the hymns we're going to do is Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. And a lot of people have sung this song and have no idea the context or the history of where this song came from. So I wanted to explain that first before we did it. The young lady that wrote the song, her name was Fanny J. Crosby. She was born back in the 1800s, one of the greatest uh, hymn writers of our time, actually. Well, not our time, but of time. She was born, and when she was young, she came, um, she had an eye infection and their regular doctor was out of town. So this quack came and treated her, put hot mustard in her eyes, caused her to go blind permanently for the rest of her life. Her mother uh, and grandmother taught her the Bible, taught her the Bible from memory. She could recite the Bible from memory, never, never having read it before. She spent her life writing hymns. She didn't really start, she was about in her 40s. One day she was going to the prison. She was quoting the Bible from memory. And one of the prisoners cried out, Lord, remember me. Do not pass me by. And it struck a chord with her. She went home and pinned the words to this song that we sing all the time, or used to sing all the time, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. The whole point of this lyric um, session for her was, God remembers those that are forgotten, those that are rejected, those that are marginalized, those that uh, no one seems to care about, those that are in distress. That's what this song is about. It's not about just give me what I need or don't pass me by give me my blessings. That's not what it's about. And I bring that up because I've run across word faith people that refuse to sing the song because they feel like it's a negative confession. That's a whole separate story. But anyway, this song is about remembering that God, Jesus, was shunned by the world. He was shamed by the world. He was rejected by the world. But yet he offers his love to us when we're rejected, when we feel lost, when we're lonely, when we feel separated. And that can happen even those that are working. You can be working all the time and feel like, Lord, there's no end. I am stressed. I am beat down. I'm lonely. In my marriage, I'm lonely. At my job, I'm lonely. Jesus, in the Bible, tells us, cry out to the Lord. Psalm 61 says, cry out to the Lord. And you can cry out to him and say, Lord, please don't pass me by. So before we sing this song, um, I want us to meditate on that thought for just a moment. We're going to play a little clip, just a couple minutes long. And Mary's going to come help us lead into this song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. And hopefully we'll do it with greater understanding of what we're actually singing about when we sing that. Let's play the clip for me. I am seeking, searching for the things this world has rejected, the things that are broken, that are flawed, thrown away and discarded. I seek the lost, the damaged, the forgotten things, the overlooked and the neglected things that have been pushed aside and left behind.
why? Why do I do this? Why chase after that which is despised by so many? It is because I have chosen the rejected. I bring restoration to the broken. I see beyond the flaws and the imperfections, and I bring new life to the lost. This world has called them useless and garbage, hopeless and unwanted. They have been scarred, abused, ignored, and unloved, but I, I have reclaimed them, and they belong to me now. They are my masterpiece, and I have a plan and a future for every single one. For I am crafting these dissonant and discarded pieces into something beautiful.
sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful, peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me, now safe. worship service. We've come to the time in our worship service where we are talking about giving back. When we sing songs such as, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, and love lifted me, our heart should be primed and ready to just say, Lord, whatever it is that you've given to me, here it is back to you. And that is what tithes and offerings should always be about, a thankful heart for what God has done to give back to him what was his in the first place. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you have allowed us to gather as your people in your place. Lord, we are thankful that you have deposited just not financial blessings into our bank accounts, into our 401ks, or wherever you have deposited money, but we are thankful that you have deposited your son into our life because that is far worth more than anything that we could physically see with money. 
Father, as we know that we have been given treasures here, we just ask, Lord, that you just prick our hearts during this time if we have sang and we have worshiped you to unclench our fists and give your money back to you to do the work that you have set out in the kingdom. Father, we'll be so thankful, gracious to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, Middleville. Um, good morning to our visitors. Good morning to uh, our family that worships regularly every Sunday. A uh, special thank you to our, uh, welcome to, I should say, to our senior saints. I see some faces that I have not seen since the beginning of the pandemic, and it's such a blessing to look out and see some of those faces. Um, let us pray. Father God, we come to you, Lord, this day, and we just want to thank you, Father God. Lord, we thank you once again, Lord, for just giving us the opportunity to be here, Lord. Lord, you've watched over us, Lord, as we traveled here today, Lord, and uh, we thank you for that, Father God. We praise you, Lord, because we look out through these windows right now and we see the sun shining, Father God. Lord, it's only through you, Father God, that we can just be here, Lord. Just praise your name, Father God. Lord, I, I, I ask a special prayer, Father God, for those that could not be here today, Father God, that wanted to be here, Lord. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you continue to touch them, Father God. Lord, I, I, I pray, Father God, for those that uh, are watching online also, Father God, for the first time, Lord. Lord, if there may be somebody, Lord, that don't know you, Lord, that is watching right now, Father God. Lord, let this be the day, Lord, that they may come to know you, Father God. Let this be the day maybe they hear a word from my pastor, Father God, that pricks their heart, Lord, that makes them think maybe there's something greater that I don't know about, Lord. Let this be the day, Father God. Lord, we thank you, Father God. We just thank you, Lord. We lift you up and we just praise you, Father God. Lord, I want to just say a, a special prayer, Father God, for our college students, Father God, that will be going back within uh, these next couple of weeks, Father God. Lord, you have blessed them in so many ways, Father God. Lord, not, don't let them take this for granted, Father God, that, uh, Lord, there are people, Lord, that children that don't have this opportunity, Father God, to pursue a higher education, Father God, but, Lord, you bless them, Lord, Lord, we, and we thank you for that, Father God. Lord, I thank you for the, the, the many sacrifices that parents have made, Father God, for these students, Father God. Lord, the many sacrifices that maybe aunts and uncles, Lord, that uh, have made and and given money, Lord, that, uh, that maybe they didn't have, Lord, but they, they blessed their, their, uh, their uh, nieces and nephews, Father God, with just what they had, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you. Let them see, Lord, that, that, you, that you're watching out from them, Father God, in, in so many different ways, Father God. Lord, I ask a special prayer, Father God, for these, these children, Father God. Lord, they will, they will meet all types of people, Father God, on this journey, Father God. Old, young, black, white, every nationality, Father God, Lord. Uh, and Lord, they, they will see things that they haven't seen before, Father God. Lord, protect them, Lord. Open their eyes, Father God. Their parents won't be there, Father God, to, to walk them through this, Father God. Lord, but you will be there, Father God. Lord, allow them to see what's coming, Father God. Lord, this is a, this is a special time, Father God, for them, Father God. A time for them, Lord, to exercise independence, Father God. Lord, that's a, that's, that's a big thing, Father God. That's a real big thing. But it's a scary thing too, Father God, for someone, that, Lord, that's, that's never been outside uh, their homes, Lord, on their own, Father God. Lord, we just, we just ask that you touch them, Lord. Touch them during this time, Father God. Lord, they'll, they'll need, Father God, various things on this journey, Father God. They'll need uh, friends, Father God. Friends, Lord, that will support them during this walk, Father God, as they get on these campuses, Father God. So they'll need uh, friends that they can trust too, Father God. 
Lord, we ask, Lord, just walk with them, Lord. Hold them, Father God. Watch over them, Father God. Keep them, Lord. Father God, I ask a special prayer, Father God, for our pastor, Lord, as he prepares the word today, Father God. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you uh, guide his tongue, Father God. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you give him uh, direction, Father God, on presenting the gospel, Father God, and presenting this message today, Father God. Lord, if there's, no, if there's someone out there, Lord, that doesn't know you, Lord, and just within these walls, Father God, let them hear your word, Father God. Let them know, Father God, that they can come to you, Lord, during this time. Father God, I ask a special prayer also, Lord, for our nation right now, Father God. Lord, there's, there's division, Father God, out there, Father God. Lord, you know what that division is, Father God. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you bring this nation together, Father God, as we, as we try to combat this pandemic, Father God. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you allow people to see, Father God, that, you know, you're in charge, Lord. Lord, you're in charge of all things, Father God. And that they can, you know, let, let people know, Lord, that, that you are, Lord, the true vaccine, Father God. Lord, you are the one that's going to ultimately heal all, Father God. Let us trust in you, Father God. And Father God, we ask these things in your precious Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello again, everybody. I'm coming to you with the sermon title, the least of these. The scripture for the sermon will be uh, 2 Thessalonians chapters 3, verse 6 through 13. Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother and sister who is idle and does not live according to, to the tradition received from us. For you yourselves know how you should imitate us. We were not idle among you. We did not eat anyone's food free of charge. Instead, we labored and tailored, working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It is not that we don't have the right to support, but we did it to make ourselves an example so that you would imitate us. In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who are idle. They are not busy, but busy bodies. We command and ex exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and provide for themselves. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. I read to you 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. Thank you. Before the pastor comes up to preach today, we're going to have a special selection by one of our uh, graduates that is leaving us, going away. Hopefully to return soon, one day, to his church home. He doesn't forget about us. Okay, before I go home. Alonzo White is going to come up and give us a special selection with his mom, Michelle, uh, just before the pastor comes up to preach today. Hello again. One of my favorite things about our church is that everything that we do is always biblically based. From the music, to the sermon, to the offering, to the call to worship, everything is rooted in God's word. As Ray led us this morning with the understanding of the meaning of the songs that we sang, I also want to share the meaning behind the song Oceans. It was written by a group called Hillsong, and they focused on a very particular and familiar passage in scripture where Peter got out of the boat, affixed his gaze on Jesus, and walked to him. 
sometimes God calls us into uncharted water in that ocean. God allowed me to kind of see a glimpse of that up close this week, well actually a week and a half ago when we were on vacation. We were at the ocean and this song truly came to life for me in that moment. Our youngest daughter was in the ocean with her inner tube floating and I'm sitting on the shore and I can see her and I'm thinking, Autumn, you have to come back because I can't get to you. So I called her back and I said, honey, please don't go far because I can't reach you. I can't get to you fast enough if you float because the waters are so choppy. It was in that moment my husband said, it's okay. I'm in the water with her. I'm in the ocean with her. I got her. If she floats, I got her. I can see her when I'm in the ocean with her. And so my encouragement this morning is just as my daughter's earthly father said, I got you. Our spiritual father is saying the same thing when he calls us out into uncharted territory, uncharted waters that we don't know. When we float and those waves are choppy and the things of life are hard, God is truly there in the midst. Let me walk. 
Thank you all for leading us in the worship. I just appreciate all the praise music and the songs and the prayer. Thank God for that as we continue on our journey in, into the text. We praise God for all who have come, and I want to personally say thank you for the many people in the body of Christ at this church who have encouraged me. Larry, Pastor Larry, you need to get away. So this summer, um, I've taken some time off, and I'm recharged, and ready to go. But I thank God for those who saw fit to say, you got to take the time off. And I, I finally did it. And, and the summer is the best time because my wife's a teacher. And so that's, that's when she's flexible. So thank God for that. And I appreciate that. But old Sophia is back home now. And so <laughs> <laughs> Sophia back home. So uh, y'all, we're going to continue. Let's pray. Lift up Christ first. Get right into the scriptures. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We pray and thank you. We just need you today. We lean on you. Without you, we can do nothing. These things we pray in thy son Jesus' name. Help us even now, Lord. Help us now. Amen. Amen. Three weeks ago, I started a series called Ministering to the Least of Them. And I told you guys when I was preaching that series um, that I was going to, at some point, add some boundaries to it or, in a sense, create some, bring some order to the sermon because I know from, from the ears, it, 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 seems as if, it seems as if we just help, 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 and help as a church without any qualifications. So I, I want to review first, and then I'm going to get a little deeper. We're going to take one step today, and then one step next week and probably finish up in three weeks. Let's review. First of all, I said this. Believers, true believers must be available to be used by God. If God has to call you multiple times and you never pick up the phone, there may be a good chance you don't know him as Lord and Savior. One of the defining factors of Christians who truly know Christ, and we see this in John 10, is he says this about, my, he says this about his people. My sheep hear my voice. That is an invoyable command whereby which God says, I know and can guarantee those who truly know me will hear my voice. So people who are unavailable consistently, it is safe to say you might not know Christ because believers make themselves available to be used by God. Number two, believers serve with pure motives. That is not to say we never have bad motives. Sometimes we do, and when we do, the Lord will convict us and we will repent. But to serve with pure motive says, I'm doing things for the right reason. With the Lord, is not so much what you do, it's the heart that you do it in. You can have the right external action, but with the wrong heart. Are you following me? You must have both the right heart, and if you have a right heart, it will always lead to a right action. Are you following me? So we serve with pure motives. We don't do it to be praised. We don't serve to be glorified. We don't give people blessings that, so that our name can be honored and we get a picture in the church hall of fame. All of that is secondary. If, if you like me, you would rather your name be written in the Lamb's Book of Life than the church roll book. <laughs> it's much more important than having some uh, 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 glorified title on this earth. I'd rather have my title on the other end. Believers serve with pure motives. You got to check yourself because on the outside believers, people will see the right action and they may be inclined to then glorify you. Girl, you always here serving. You always serving. But you got to be careful just because you're here, just because you're doing stuff don't mean you're doing it for the right reasons. Amen. You got to, only you can kind of delve deep. That's why before it says take communion, it says examine yourself. That means put yourself under a microscope and ask yourself, am I serving for the right reasons? Pure motives. Number three, believers learn how to prioritize eternal matters. Eternal matters. Believers learn how to prioritize eternal matters. My oldest daughter was in her freshman year at college. She called me one day 
frantic. She had fallen behind a little bit in her classes. And it was, and when you know college, it ain't like high school. You ain't getting five chances to do no assignment. And the professor don't care if you show up. High school, you may get a call. Your parents know if you don't. In college, you can skip every day. They don't care as long as they got your tuition money. So she was swimming. So I said, well, what's going on? So she started to tell me all the activities. That was good. She had joined a paper staff. She had done other activities, good extracurricular activities, give her a well-rounded ex education. But, but what happened was she had added so much to her life, guess what fell at the bottom? School. So I said, babe, you, you got to reprioritize. What was the objective? The reason you here is to come out of this boy with that paper, to, to find out your purpose and, and to walk in your purpose. In the same way, y'all, in this life, a lot of good things will come up. Children, grandchildren, work, job, stuff, and they're good. I'm not saying it. But, but what happened is, even with good things, they can push the right thing to the bottom. Satan is crafty at taking good stuff and having you prioritize over the, the most meaningful objective. What is the chief end of man but to glorify God and enjoy him forever? So our bottom line objective in a church individually in your walk with the Lord is to glorify God. So every activity that you add and do ought to feed that objective. Are you following me? So believers learn how to prioritize eternal matter. We learn, you know how you get older and you learn how to say, you learn how to neglect certain things but give other things more time. That takes time and maturity, but as a believer, you grow to learn, I can't do that because that might take me away from this, right? So we learn how to prioritize eternal matters. Number four, believers are motivated by their future reward with God rather than man. Believers are motivated. What gets you up every day, y'all? What makes you, you know, give you that passion? You know, the, when you just hear, for some of y'all, hopefully it's your spouse. They just waking up and saying, babe, how you doing this morning? I just love waking up to you or, I, you know, I just enjoy you. I hope that's your testimony. Mm. Then you, you go to your kid's room and they done cleaned up and everything looking nice. They downstairs ready to go for school. Those are the things that motivate you and, and get you going in a day. So you got to ask yourself, what is your motivation? Believers are ultimately motivated by their future reward in heaven. For we must all stand, watch this, before the judgment seat of Christ so that our works may be evaluated. There's nothing wrong with looking forward to that day and living your life accordingly. We just saw the Olympics. Am I right about it? Do you think they was training just to get there? Do you think the ones that put in hours, ate right, worked out, trained, went to sleep, trained, do you think they did that simply to just be invited to the Olympics? No, they did it because they was motivated by the by the possibility that they may stand and have a gold medal draped around their neck. In the same way, believers, we got to be motivated by our future reward with God. Here's what that does. It makes you more focused. It makes you, it lets you know what to let go and what to keep. It lets you know that ministry I can do, that I won't do. It makes you more, more focused in the sense that you know where you're going. So believers, we know what we need to do. Now, now let's move a little bit. Let's transition. I'm going to read these texts. I think they'll have them on the board, but I don't want you to go to them. I just want you to hear them. So I'm going to start in the Torah, right? The Old Testament is broken down in, in, in four ways. I'm going to start with scriptures from the Torah, Deuteronomy 15 and 7. If you fast enough, go there. If not, depend on the board for now. If there's a poor person among you, one of your brothers within any of your city gates in the land the Lord God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted, you see that word, towards your poor brother. Deuteronomy 15 and 11. I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. For there will never cease to be poor people in the land. That is why I'm commanding you, open your hand willingly to the poor and needy. 
brother in your land. That's the Torah. Now let's go to the historical books, 1 Samuel 2 and 8. 1 Samuel, history book. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the trash heap. He seats them with noblemen and gives them a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord. He sets the world on them, on them the poor. He raises the poor from dust and lifts the needy from the trash heap. Now let's move and transition to the poetry books. Psalm 34 and 6. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. Psalm 40 and 17. I'm oppressed and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my helper and my deliverer. My God, do not delay. Psalm 41 and 1. Happy is he who is considerate of the poor. The Lord will save him in the day of adversity. Proverbs 14, 31. The one who oppresses the poor person insults his maker, but one who is kind to the needy honors him. Proverbs 19, 17. This one, this one right here, you got to sit on this one. Kindness to the poor is alone to the Lord, and he will give a reward to the lender. You, you, when do God ever need anything from us? This squares well with the text that, that is the foundation. Whatever you do for the least of them, you do for me. Kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord. So as you give to the poor, as if you let God borrow money that he don't need, he'll give a reward to the lender. Let's go from Psalms, which is the poetry books, now to the prophetic books, Amos 4.1. Listen to the message, you cows of Bastion, who are on the hills of Samaria, women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, who say to their husband, bring us something to drink. Amos is calling down judgment on those women who are not caring for the poor. Now let's go to the New Testament, James 2 and 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, didn't God chose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? From the Torah, the history, the prophetic, the poetry, to the New Testament, in other words, the whole narrative of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelations, it is clear that God has a heart for the poor. Oh, Lord. Well, it's safe to say that from this. I don't went through every book. It seems, y'all, from the scriptures alone, that individually and corporately, we should help the poor, watch this, in all circumstances without qualifications. But is that really true? It seems from the pericope or narrative of scripture that we are to help the poor whatever the need without qualifications. Now, what would this look like in the local church? Question. What would that look like if everybody could come to the church and we would always have an open hand irregardless of the situation? Should we help those who are members and saved in the same way we help those who are not believers? All questions, rhetorical. Should we help folks financially who we believe are in an active state of addiction to drugs and alcohol? Should we help folks who are living in sinful situations who are experiencing the consequences of their behavior? In a church of believers, watch this, there will be a broad spectrum of beliefs related to the benevolence in the church. All right, it's a broad spectrum. I'm going to give you one extreme right now. One extreme are the givers. So if you split this room up, you got the givers on the left and the misers on the right. The givers. These are the people that believe the church should be prepared to give without regard to the circumstances and the need. They say things like this. I give it to them. I don't care what they use it on. That's between them and God. They rarely say no. They believe a large portion of the church resources should go to the poor. In other words, the building go to the shot. Okay, that's all right. We'd be okay. We can worship even when we ain't got no roof. We don't need carpet and all that. We just, church, we give to the poor. Even the people that work for the church, uh, you just, you get by on just enough to put a piece of corn on the plate for your family and give your money away. Those are the givers. 
and I love them to death. They're the ones that, no, we got to meet needs. We got to meet needs. That's one extreme. Let me give you the other extreme. That's the miser, you know, the Scrooge McDuck or the Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> These are the people who make people fill out 20 pages of applications to get funds. They want to run their credit report and then make them wait 10 business days when they need rent help and they only give them a small portion of their rent. Person came and needed $600 and we make them wait 10 days for $50. These are the folk that say this, people need to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps like I did. The third group, in between that continuum or spectrum are people who lean more towards the miser and lean more towards the giver. Now, as the pastor of that paradigm, it is so difficult to manage all of this because it's no decision I'm going to make or the leadership makes that's not going to make certain people unhappy. Why you do that? You shouldn't have gave to them. Or you didn't give enough to them, right? I've seen churches where the pastor sleep with half the church, but they, that's cool. But let him or let the church give to somebody they shouldn't, that'll cause a business meeting. That money piece, y'all, when you start involving money and how it's given and how it's distributed, it has broken up more churches than sexual immorality ever has. Churches are split on a drop of a dime over that kind of stuff. So we got to determine when God, let me, let me go here. Ecclesiastes gives us some help, y'all. Y'all, I've read Ecclesiastes and never really saw this verse. I'm going to read it out of three different translations. I'm going to start in this. It's Ecclesiastes 7.18. Ecclesiastes 7.18. It's on the board. Let's start in the CSB. It is good that you grasp the one, but do not let the other slip from your hand. For the one who fears God will end up with both of them. Solomon, what you saying? Now let's read it out the NIV. It's a little clearer. It is good to grasp the one and don't let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Now let's go to the message. I don't read the message because that's a paraphrase. But in this one, they did a good job of paraphrasing this verse. It is best to stay in touch with both sides of an issue. A person who fears God deals responsibly with all reality, not just a piece of it. You see that, though? In other words, you can't be extreme here and extreme here. It is better on most issues to be balanced. Am I preaching, y'all? Huh? John said it best about the Lord. Our Lord, chapter 1 of John, came full of grace and truth, right? Full of both of them. That's balance right there, right? Too much grace, people run over you, right? Too much truth is not empathetic and sensitive to people's situation. Jesus is both full of grace, he's sympathetic to your situation, he understands what he's going through, and he's full of truth. So as a pastor, the best I can do in, in the leadership is to try to be balanced in how we look at these things. Now let's move. Solomon seems to be saying, y'all, that it is wise to have a balanced view of life issues and that the right answer is usually a mixture of two positions, not an all or nothing. Amen. I wonder if somebody could tell the American political situation this text right there. I wonder. The word they use in politics is called bipartisan, right? But I wonder. If everybody would humble themselves and say, I don't have the right answers, you don't have, let's come and sit down at the table. Huh? It's important, watch this, another point you need to hear. It's important you realize, y'all, this is, this, this is pulpit to the body. When you interpret scripture, you have an interpretive grid, which means that when you read it, it goes through your brain, Right? Whereby which you interpret this stuff through your social and political lens. All of us have a social and political lens. The, the only time, and I'm teaching now, you can get out of that is to kind of almost pull yourself out of your social and political lens. First know what it is. 
and then to be objective and say, if the Lord speaks against my blend, against my, my lens, I will adjust my lens to the scripture. Amen. You follow me? No, y'all not. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. In law, they call it presuppositions. Presuppositions are accepted conclusions without evidence yet. In other words, all of us have them, right? When you, when you go to the scriptures, you have presuppositions. You have a lens through which you interpret the text. What you have to do when you read the scriptures is submit to the objective word of God and say, if I read something that challenges what I have already accepted as truth, I will adjust to the scriptures, yeah. right? Yeah. So when you read certain texts, here's what you do. <laughs> Let me tell the illustration first. I like trail mix in my house. I love trail mix. Like my mama's Pepsi a couple weeks, I get my little trail mix and I got it sealed up in a little jar. Nuts, raisins, you know, all the good stuff. And it has M&Ms in them. Right? I ain't gonna lie. Huh? I ain't saying about it. I like my trail mix. So, my youngest daughter eats my trail mix, but here's what she does. She goes and picks out the M&M's and eats those and leaves me to rest. Now, the whole key to a good trail mix is a mixture of salt and sweet. Am I going to come in my preaching? Eh? She has eaten all the sweet, leaving me just the salt. But that is an illustration how most of us read the Bible. We, we eat what we want and leave what we don't want, come on preacher, away. Uh, are you following me? We, we, we got to accept it as a whole. So to the giver, when they hear scriptures about the poor, do you see what the Bible says? We got to give. But then to the miser, if a man don't work, he ought not eat. That, that, oh, you see that right there? That is poor exegesis. Those, both of those scriptures are in the Bible, so they must be blended together, and we must come to right conclusions about both of them. Yeah. Are you following me? Both of them are there. You can't write one out. Uh, first, that second, the Lord said, if a man don't work, he ought not eat. Matter of fact, that text also said, you shouldn't eat, even eat with him. He should be put out the church. So all these uh, young men who don't take care of their children, and if one of them is your son, and you still give him solace, in your house, you still provide for him while you know he's not taking care of his kids. The Bible says if you're a Christian, you should break fellowship with your own son. Ooh. That's what the word say. Said don't even associate with him. Your own son. If you're not taking care of his kids, your own son, the Bible says cut him off. You can't write that out the word. But the Bible also says be kind, open-handed to the poor. So when you, when you see this apparent contradiction, how do you get it out or, or get to a truth? Let me give you a third point. Saints, the Bible is not a step-by-step -step protocol on how to make wise decisions. The Bible is a supernatural narrative that tells a story of God sending his son to rescue mankind from the grips of a death sentence imposed by God. It is a just punishment for our rebellion. The story is culminated by the restoration of all things that have pollute, been polluted by man's rebellion. That's what the Bible is about. It is not primarily, okay, let me see how to do this. It's not, what, it's not a directions how to cook fish or how to make a cake. Now, in that, so then, well, Lord, well, what do we do? Here's what you do. When there's no direct word about what you should do, you look for principles about how God does things. You look for principles. Take the vaccination anti-vax. And when you don't know, and I'm not going to come to any conclusions in this room. Everybody is all over the place with this one. When you don't know, you look for principles in the word because you will not find a scripture that God says, do not take that vaccine. Or you won't find a scripture that says, take the vaccine. That's not in there. Amen. So what do you do? You look for principles. Now let's, let's, let's move. First and only point in this sermon. As a rule, 
Benevolence, as a rule, benevolence should be conditional. Benevolence should be conditional. When we say benevolence, let's define. This is when you privately or the church corporately gives to help the needs of members and unbelievers. Financially, primarily. Number one, as a rule, benevolence should be conditional. Y'all quiet. We've always thought God's love was unconditional. Well, it's not. God's love to you is unconditional, but it cost him his son. So it was conditional. The only way we have eternal life is somebody had to die for our sins. You just didn't pay the cost. So it was free to us, but it cost him his own son. So now let's go to a story in the Old Testament to help us get this first point ironed out. Principles. Remember I said principles. You're not going to find scripture to say, don't do this most time, don't do that. As a rule, benevolence should be conditional. Ruth chapter 2. I want you to go there. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. It's on the board. Now, I don't want y'all to get used to that board all the time, especially you young kids, you teenagers. You need to learn what the Bible book says yourself, so bring your Bibles to church. This is just an aid. Bring your word to church or your phones. You ain't always going to have no projector. Now, Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side. He was a prominent man of noble character from Elimelech's family. His name was Boaz. Ruth the Moabitess asked Naomi, will you let me go into the field and gather fallen grain behind someone with whom I found favor? Naomi answered her, go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain behind the harvester. She happened to be in the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was, Elimelech, who was from Elimelech's family. Later, when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, he said to the harvesters, The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they replied. Boaz asked his servants, who were in charge of the harvesters, Who is that woman? Whose young woman is this? The servant answered her, She is a young Moabite woman who returned from Naomi from the territory of Moab. She asked, Will you let me gather fallen grain from the bundles of behind the harvesters? She came and has been on her feet since early morning, except that she rested a little in the shelter. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in another person's field. Ruth must have been fine. And don't leave this one, but stay here close to my female servants. I'm not exegeting the book of Ruth. This is to make a strict point in this text. But let's give you just a touch of background. Naomi was married to Elimelech. They had to move, but well, they didn't have to. They chose to move because of famine in Judah, and they went to a place called Moab. During that time, and she took her two sons, Malin and Chilion. During that time, Elimelech died, but her sons also married as well. And then a decade later, after Elimelech died, her sons passed away. And if you know anything about the ancient world, the oldest son is supposed to take care of his mom and his wife, right? So now... Her husband, Naomi's husband's dead, and both of her sons are dead, leaving her and her two daughters-in-law. Her daughters-in-law were Oprah and Ruth. It's time to go back home now because she has fallen on tough times. She cannot care for herself, and it seems from the text she's older. She said, let me go on back to my people's house and see if anybody else can basically care for me in my old age. So she told Oprah, and she said, and Ruth, y'all going back to Moab. I can't take care of y'all. Go back to your God and all that. Uh, I love y'all, but it's better for y'all to separate and go find husbands. Y'all still young. Go get a man. And so Oprah went back, but Ruth said, I ain't going back. But they went back destitute and poor. Now, this is where we are in chapter 2. Now, what this text does, y'all, is give us an ancient snapshot into the ancient world's way of taking care of the poor. This is not an apples to apples comparison with our contemporary system. In our world, if somebody falls on tough times, they go to the DHS office and fill out for food stamps, to, uh, get Medicaid, and, and get some help, and maybe get a check, or, or get some, uh, uh, what do you call that when you have to live in somebody's house? Section 8, right? They get help. But, but, but Israel had a way of caring for the poor. 
Now, watch this. Ruth asked permission from her mother to go and gather wheat and produce from other people's fields. When no one from Naomi's house stepped up, y'all, to help Ruth, Ruth takes it upon herself to care for both of them. Ruth planned to go into other people's fields and pick up fallen produce. She went to other people's fields and pick up fallen produce, wheat, whatever she can get. Question is, what's she stealing? Now let's see if we can get some more data from Scripture to find out why she would do something like this. Leviticus 19, 9 through 10. Leviticus 19, 9 through 10. This is how we dig in the text, y'all. This is a syst systematic study of the Bible. Leviticus 19, 9 through 10. There's your text. It's on the board as well. When you reap, this is, this is a part of the law given to the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. When you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap to the very edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and the resident alien. A resident alien is somebody from another ethnic group. I am the Lord, your God. That's the system. It was a command. It was not a suggestion. Amen. Nine through ten. The welfare system of the ancient world was this. After giving the first ten percent to the Lord, the landowner was then able to harvest his produce for his family and to sell. But he was commanded to also not glean or harvest all the way to the edges of the land. As an example, you, say you had a hundred rows of corn and you had a farm. The Lord would get the first 10 rows. You would get row 11 through 89. And then the poor person would get 90 to 100. This is a command of God so that essentially the poor could eat and sustain themselves during famine and times of struggle. Are you following me? You get it right. Now let's go back to Ruth. Now that you understand the ancient system of taking care of the poor. Ruth chapter 2, 1 through 2. Ro Ruth asked her mama-in-law, I got to go take care of us. Are you seeing something there? I got to take care of us. Naomi gave her the okay. Go ahead, baby, and see what you can do. Verse 2. She's going to gather fallen grain. Ruth had been in Israel long enough to be taught according to the Old Testament law while in the midst of harvesting produce fall on the ground, y'all, and that's supposed to be left there so that the poor could gather it up. So Ruth went to look for fallen produce. That lets you know the desperation that she and Naomi were experiencing, but it also tells you some more truth. So as they harvest this wheat and grain and they put it in baskets, whatever fell to the ground, the harvester was not to sweep it up and put it in the basket. They leave it on the ground. That was for the poor. So verses 3 through 7, let's move. So Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain behind the harvesters. She happened to be in the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was from Elimelech's family. Hey, the narrator, I think, is using a little sarcasm when he says she happened to be there. All that was planned because they got married. <laughs> y'all women, y'all be something else with that boy. <laughs> I just happened to be here today. No, go ahead. Later when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, she said to the harvester, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they replied. Boaz asked his servants, who was in charge of the harvesters and whose young woman is this? The servant answered, she that young Moabite woman who returned from Naomi from the territory of Moab. She asked, will you let me gather fallen grain among the bundles behind the, behind the harvesters? She came and has been on her feet since early. You see that there? Do you see that there? Early morning. Except she took a small lunch break under a little shelter. Three through four. Ruth humbly went into fields and patiently walked behind harvesters and collected what was falling out of the basket of the harvesters. Can you imagine the humility it would take for you to literally walk behind folk and whatever they leave on the ground, you put in your basket? Y'all, I don't know if you've had this, 
But it ain't nothing like somebody who asking for help but want to do it with pride. Or they ask for help and going to let you know how they going to spend it. I tell them, yeah, I can, yeah you need some money? I, I'll take you. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I said, okay, I'm not going to give you straight cash, but I'm going to give you a package of bologna and some bread and some cheese, and you can go to work on that. I'm good. I thought you was hungry. Don't you know, y'all, at, at the church, that's a simple example, but the people, they want your help on their terms. Are you following me? Huh? When you say, well, ma'am, we want to help you or sir, we want to help you, but here's what we require. We just want to know where the check is going. Oh, that's, that's my business. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, but, but see, the, here's the misconception about the church. And we created the, we created the monster. We, we totally created this. You can go to church and get anything you need. Whatever you want, you can get it there. Because... And then if you don't give it, oh, y'all don't follow the Bible? <laughs> From this text, y'all, Ruth had to do what? Humble herself. When you want somebody else's stuff and you need it, you got to humbly accept the terms they put on it. It's to protect themselves and you. Am I right about it? One of the worst things that happened to our African-American people, it hurt us more than it did Caucasians, it hurt everybody, was the New Deal in some ways by FDR. It was a way of, in a sense, righting the wrongs of slavery, but they just poured cash without mostly any conditions. And in some ways, it robbed us of a sense of work it robbed us of a sense. You know, my mom talks about it. She said this lovingly. She's not hating on anybody who's had to get welfare benefits now. But she said, in our generations, none of us would have went down to the welfare office. Am I preaching it to some old saints? We would have figured that thing out. We would have tried to do what we needed to do. We would have worked and trusted the Lord, right? And I'm not hating on nobody who had to use them. I'm just saying that's a generational shift, what happens. In, and now watch what they did. He say, you can't get benefits if there's a man living in your house with you or you married. So guess what that did? It was an impetus or almost a motivation for black relationships not to get married because the woman could get more if there wasn't no husband or man living with them. Am I preaching? Huh? No, tell me the truth, am I preaching? Huh? You understand what I'm saying? Uh, so that's that. To accept that, I have to accept the whole party's belief. And you don't. You need to separate from that and say, that had an effect on the black household. Statistically, if the number and data are clear. Anytime you encourage two people not to be married because the woman can get more by herself with her kids, I would rather two people struggle and eat macaroni and cheese than be separate trying to get more money from the government. That was a tangent, but I love you. Ruth, humbly, humble. So one of the principles we look for when we give is the person humble. That's a principle. Are they humble or are they entitled? Entitled. Let's move. In the midst of gleaning, she found herself in the midst of Boaz's field, a relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. Verses 5 through 6. Boaz asked his servants, who are in charge of the harvester, whose young woman is this? The servant answered, she that young Moabite woman who returned from Naomi from the territory of Moab. Clearly, this was Boaz's first time seeing Ruth, but he had heard about her because he asked his servants who she is. So he hadn't seen her, he didn't see her, but he had heard about her. That's in the later verses. Verse 6, the servant tells Boaz, the servants that work in the field tell Boaz, that's the young Moabite woman who came with Naomi. Notice what they say about her. Look what they say, y'all. Look at your text, verse 6. She came and has been on her feet since early morning. What time the harvest to start, y'all? Ain't no street lights. They work when the sun's up, and they stop working when the sun goes down. Six to six. Twelve-hour shift. 
except she took a little rest in the shelter. They described her by putting emphasis on her work ethic. That stood out to them. Although she's gleaning from someone else's field, she had a desire to work hard to get what was given to her. So what can we, what conclusions can we draw from this text? Remember the point. As a rule, benevolence from the church should be conditional. Because the Old Testament system was built on a condition. The rich person could have easily gathered up all of the grain and then taken it to the poor. But the way the system was built, the poor person had to get up with the harvester. You see that? They had to get up the same time as the harvester. They couldn't come at 12. They had to get, when y'all working, I'm at work. Am I preaching right? So it's conditional, right? And we're not going to put it in the basket for you. If you need the help, God has set up a system. You just got to go out there and glean it yourself. Now, gleaning and harvesting is hard work. It's not easy work. Harvesters have to work hard for that. So you got to go out there and do the same thing as the harvester if you want to eat. That's in the Bible. So as a rule, benevolence should never be free and without conditions. The church shouldn't be sending God's money to people and you don't require anything in return from them. Conditional. Now, I say it as a rule. So let's get some application as we tie this up. Let's get some application. The whole of Israel's benevolence to the poor, y'all, was conditional. In the sense, they could not just receive blessings without humbly going out and working in the same manner as the harvester. They had to do the same thing. This was tedious and time-consuming work. Principle for a church and you privately. If your son is in the basement playing PlayStation and he's 22 years old and you continue to feed, what you want, hunt? How you, (laughs) why are you taking your son's order? You're not his servant. He in the basement playing field, coming in your house all late. How, what time you get in? Oh, my, I got in like three. He 30. And you still ask him what time he got in. You preparing his little meal for him, packing his lunch for him, what he needs somebody to do. No, he don't. My mama didn't do that for me. At some point, you got to go. You learn to pack your own stuff, wash your own clothes. Because if you don't cook, then you guess you ain't going to be eating. Am I right about it? Do all of that stuff and then get your behind out my house. Lord have mercy. You know, I came home one day, my first visit from college. First visit. I had been gone three weeks. Couldn't tell me nothing. All right, mom, I did good. Y'all ain't got to pay for me. I got a scholarship. So I expected to come home and get nice barbecue ribs, you know, all that. Have everything real nice, bed made, and put a little mint on my bed. You know them little Andy's mints or something like that? <laughs> put that on my bed. I came home, had my little stuff, went back to my bedroom. There ain't no beds. <laughs> we got a three-bedroom house. It's five of us. I'm like, well, Mom, is it, you working on my bed? Are you doing so you're going to bring it back in or something? Oh, no, as soon as y'all left up out of there, we got rid of those beds. That's not your father's office. Well, mom, mom, where you want me to sleep at? Delivery room couch. Because I want you to be real clear, you don't have a permanent home here anymore. Am I right about it? You don't have a permanent home. It's not your address anymore. Your address is at college in your dorm room. You can come home, maybe use the washing machine, grab yourself a bite to eat, but you're going to pack up and I'm going to send you down to that But I ain't going to college with no car. I go right down on Michigan Avenue, catch the bus, two and a half hours, and go right there, and go, hey, let me tell you what it is. It's Dearborn, then Inkster, and then Ypsilanti, then Ann Arbor, then Jackson, then Albion, and then Battle Creek, and then Kalamazoo. <laughs> what nothing in that house. She made that thing real comfortable in that house. I ain't want to come home. I, I ain't coming home this weekend. I love y'all. I know the trip. Here's the odd part. On the trips, I would steal my dad's books. He'd buy John MacArthur books, Tony Evans. He'd buy it, I'd steal it from his office, and I'd read the book all the way to college when I first got saved. So if I was driving, I wouldn't have been able to do that. 
I read it all the way and back. That's when I started to build my theology. It was I thing. And then he called me and said, boy, did you take my book? <laughs> but down deep, he, he started to just buy two copies of every book he bought. I think he liked it after a while. Like, I'm glad that boy is learning. I could have asked him first, but I just stole it because I didn't want to say no. But, <laughs> but in a sense, y'all, parents, parents individually pride, make your house uncomfortable for your grown kids. Make it uncomfortable. If your child needs some help for a second, I ain't talking about that, but long-term help should be conditional, right? Let's move. When I say as a rule, benevolence must be conditional, generally speaking, y'all, the church should not be helping folks without some measure of requirement on behalf of the giver. Submission to financial courses. We want to know where the check's going or you ain't getting it. Things like that. We should be requirements to get the funds. Watch this. People who have a mind to work but fall on hard times will generally never complain about conditions they need to meet to get help. People who have a mind to work will generally never complain about what they need to do if they fall on hard times. They will do it to get the help. Hmm? Let me give you some exceptions. We're going to move next week now. Give you some exceptions. Emergency. House on fire. Immediate loss of job, death, or some type of prolonged sickness. We're going to kick in unconditionally. Are you following me? Huh? Evangelistically as a tool. A cookout for the community. Backpack drive for parents. Supporting local school districts and school with school supplies and bodies to create an inroad for the gospel. In those cases, we're not going to put conditions on it because we have an objective. If we make a connection with a school or a, or, a, or a senior house or something, we will bless them because we're trying to get our foot in the door so that we can lead them to Christ. Amen. Right? So we're not going to charge them. We're not going to do all that stuff. The objective is an inroad for the gospel. Yeah. Those are the exceptions on that text. Now, earlier you heard, hear me read scriptures about being given to the poor. Each of these sermons, I'm going to read you some other scriptures about laziness. <laughs> the son who gathers during the summer is prudent, but the son who sleeps during harvest is disgraceful. Proverbs 12 and 11. The one who works his land will have plenty of food, but whoever chases fantasies lacks sense. That's your 31-year-old son still trying to rap. Man, you missed that window. That's your 48-year-old daughter still trying to be on American Idol. That's for teenagers and young adults. You don't need to be 50 up on American Idol. Let that one go. Sing at the church. We'll give you plenty of love and affection. Something that you still trying to go to the NFL and you 38. That window is gone. And you got to be a parent that love your child enough. Whoever you talk to, you missed that window, brother man. Just go to school, try to get you a degree. You can go to school. My grandfather got his history degree, and he was 70 years old from Wayne State. They don't have that window, that same window that football and rapping do. But comedy, football, rapping, act, they got a window. And once it closes, let it go. One pastor who never prepared his sermon during the week, on Sunday morning, he sat on the platform while the church was singing hymns, and he desperately pleaded with God. Lord, give me your message. Lord, give me your message, Lord. One Sunday, while desperately praying for God's message, he heard the Lord say, Ralph, here's my message. You lazy. <laughs> Amen. If you're here today, come on, stand. <laughs> come on, stand. Y'all know we love folk at the church, but the leadership team has to discern whether somebody truly needs or that they just being lazy. Laziness is a real sin, and we're going to keep going deeper and deeper. Some folk just need to get up. You know, I know y'all ain't like me, the only ones who see all these for help signs on doors. Did y'all see it? Folk, now, we'll give you college tuition if you just apply. Now, in some sense, I do believe the market is correcting itself from years of low pay. 
I do think there's a correction happening in the market. Uh, the cost of living has been stagnant while CEO pay has raised. So I do think uh, some of that is correcting, but, but for a while there, y'all, during the pandemic and COVID, my daughters had more in their bank account than I did. I'm like, what is going on here? Y'all need to start paying rent. They give me all these checks and free money. They said no, eight, nine thousand dollars in their account. Like, God is good. Can I get some rent? <laughs> but I, after a while, they can still pull that. I said, nope, that's it. You got jobs, you good. Do not pull that money. Don't get used to that money. That money has made people in some way. I agree with it early just to get people on their feet. But in some ways, it has kind of robbed certain people. Y'all know I'm preaching. I don't care where you are politically. It has robbed people of the desire and need to go out and work and work. At some point, you're going to have to cut this off. And cut it off. You see what it does now. You can only give free money for so long. If folk ain't paid rent in two years, two years you ain't paid rent. One of, my, one of the, the most key lessons my dad taught me. He said, even if you had to stay with us for a season, that's with my family now, don't never get used to not paying rent. So you put that rent money away and stack it. We had to live with them while we was getting the house. Stack that money up. Don't spend it just because you home and can. You, as a man, you got to always, once you become grown, let alone have a wife and kid, you're going to pay rent until you die, until your house is paid off. And then you got to pay taxes. So, so if you're here today and you don't know Christ, if you're a man, particularly a man, and have lost your way, and have essentially depended on, and for the large majority of your life for your, on your mother and parents, it's time for you to step up. God wants you to. God wants you to. He wants you to get out on your own. He wants you to make your way, man. I have more respect for a person who drive a crappy car and just live in an old one-bedroom house, but if they take care of it and it's clean, I, that's honoring that. That's honoring, respecting that. And, and as you faithful with the Lord's money and all that, God, uh, he, he, you may take some steps up and that situation may improve, but your situation ain't going to never improve while you sitting up in your mom's extra bedroom. She, oh, she need to be by herself enjoying retirement. She can't go on a vacation because she's afraid you're going to have people over when she's gone. That ain't, that ain't, that's sinful. Sinful. Y'all, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, come on. Come, come on, come. I'm going to beat you up because I love you. I'm just tired. I'm exhausted. Our young men, man, Lord, have mercy. Mothers, I love you, but you part of the problem. Uh, you part of the problem. Let your husband do what he needs to do and stop calling the dogs off. Let him get in there and do what he do. Men, raise up. Do what you need to do with your sons and, and your daughters, not just your sons. I love you women, but y'all got to stand down that motherly love sometime. It, it all feel good. It's bubbly, but it ain't gonna, you're going to be raising them till he's 50. You still? Come on now. So if you're here today and you don't know Christ, come on. If you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come on. If you don't know him and you, and you need to make a decision for Christ, the most, one of the most important parts of the service is when we open the doors of the church and allow you an opportunity to come to know him as Lord and Savior. Maybe a part of your problems, young man and young woman, is you don't have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. When you have Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, things transform. Even if you don't have a father, he will become your father and he will take you where you need to go.